the folks be with us today. I know um, the commissioners have a number of follow on meetings today. So um, we've got a, uh, a full agenda, even if uh, not all of the meetings are necessarily public. Um, Rick, how are you today? Good. I'm doing good. I understand you might have a, a new team member. What do you guys buy? What's going on? We just had a whole routine about nobody asking how this day is. Corey goes, how are you doing? And I just looked at him like, what? Nobody asked me how I'm doing. Hey, Rick. How are you doing today, buddy? Yeah. Hey, Rick. You're looking good, buddy. Yeah. Anybody gets a chance to make Rick feel better today? Apparently, it works. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'd like to introduce Anthony Mancini. He's our new uh, economic development coordinator. Hey, Rick, how are you? I'm going to be you, so I started um, January 3rd uh, working with Rick, so I'll be the economic development coordinator uh, working with assisting Rick with all of our different development projects uh, that we have going on around the county, uh, working with developers and getting our sites ready for development all around the county. So uh, a little bit of my background. I previously I was in Marietta, Ohio, uh, worked for Buckeye Hills Regional Council down there. It's a regional council. So worked with local governments and township trustees, things like that on different infrastructure site projects, things like that. And also spent some time with Ohio University working with the Small Business Development Center, working with the small businesses, startups, and things like that. So uh, happy to be here and meet all of you. Welcome aboard. Thank you. And Anthony's like hit the ground running, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Day three, we already met with the developer, and it's great to have folks with experience where we got done. I'm like, okay, I know I threw in a lot of acronyms and other things out there, and he goes, I got it. <laughs> so excited to have you here. He's going to do a good thing. Well, on behalf of the Board of Commissioners, welcome. And, uh, the, uh, the Workforce Center economic development front is uh, pretty uh, high on the list of issues that the commissioners are concerning themselves with right now. So I'm sure we'll get the chance to work together on some things. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, the next item on our agenda is we're going to have uh, an opportunity uh, for a listen and learn. Uh, we've got, you know, I always get this title wrong. Is it, are you the commissioner, the director? Health commissioner. Health, the health commissioner. There we are. And it's going to uh, share with us some things that are going on there. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. And Joe, that uh, pulls out on the side if you want to set your water there. Thank you. It's fancy. There we go. <laughs> All right, I'm here to talk about the community health assessment, which we completed last year. Uh, under Ohio's law, we're required as a health department to do a community health assessment every three years. So it's a combination of a community survey. We sent out thousands of surveys to households in the, in the county. Uh, we had 700 households that, re, that filled out those surveys and sent them back in. So we were shooting for four to 500, so we did really well there. Uh, and then we look at all the regular stats that we know, you know, causes of death, illnesses, injuries, all those things. Um, and we work with our community health partners. And there's just a cover shot of the community health assessment. But here's some of our, most of our partners that worked on that with us. Of course, one really important one was the Board of County Commissioners because they provided funding for the survey this year. So that was able to pay for the consultant that, uh, you know, took care of all the surveys and, and helped compile everything. So that was a, a big uh, a big benefit to everyone. Uh, of course, we have the hospitals, you know, mental health, health care providers, uh, nonprofits, you know, YMCA's, park districts, all kinds of people that are in one way or another involved with, with the health of the community, uh, that all participated and, and gave fit feedback uh, on this survey. So the community perceptions, the survey we mail out to people, uh, some of the things we ask uh, is what do they think the most important health issue is and drug, drug alcohol addiction and abuse came up as what people perceive as the biggest health problem in the community. Uh, and then followed up with that is mental health issues. 
uh, lack of medical care access, which I think sometimes is uh, especially, you know, have to go out of county to get specialty care or finding providers that, you know, are, are affordable. Uh, issues related to COVID, obviously we're looking at this three year window. Uh, so COVID was pretty much dominant during that. Uh, and then after that, medical care costs, obesity and nutrition uh, rounded the list out. The negative impacts of the pandemic, uh, we certainly wanted to take this opportunity to kind of say, you know, pandemic, go back to the last, the previous three year survey, pre pandemic, look at this one during the pandemic to, to get to the end of it, hopefully, uh, and kind of see what those impacts were. And the level of anxiety and depression uh, jumped out as what most people thought uh, were the biggest impacts that they had felt from the uh, pandemic, as well as relationships with other people, uh, their exercise habits, which I think in some cases, um, we might see that they actually got better because people went out to the parks, people did things like that, uh, because they were less of the social things that they were doing. Financial stability, obviously an issue. Um, social, social media, use of preventive health care and screening visits. Uh, and that uh, will show up again in the survey. Uh, we asked what they'd like to receive more information about. And not surprisingly, the depression, anxiety, and mental health was at the top of the list. Uh, and then it was food assistance and, and mortgage or rent assistance. Uh, drug and alcohol abuse, job training, um, elder care, tobacco association, and things kind of went, went on down to uh, down to this. So one of the things we wanted to ask was, you know, uh, a lot of mistrust in you know the government, mistrust with media, uh, things like that. Where do people trust to get their health information? Um, so the, the health department. <clears throat> 36% uh, trust us a lot, 51% somewhat, uh, so 12%, 12.7 not trusting us at all. The Ohio Department of Health did, uh, did nearly as well, and then CDC came in uh, third on that list. Um, but was, what was interesting, if you looked at the demographics of the people that responded, this, the education and income levels, the, the higher income level, higher education levels were more trusting um, of those government agencies. The, the lower the education or, or income level, the, the more suspicious they were of, of the government agencies. So changes in, in health over time, looking at the, uh, the previous three years that we surveyed compared to this three years, the things that, that jumped out were uh, orange is a bad uh, indicator. So the routine visits to a doctor within the last year uh, dropped from almost 81% down to 76%. And that's not surprising in that doctors were focused on COVID. People were reluctant to go to the doctor because you know there's going to be people with COVID at the doctor or something. Uh, so a lot of routine, even routine surgeries and things got put off uh, during the pandemic. And then uh, having to go outside of the county for health care went up. Uh, and that may also have been that, you know, more advanced care for COVID, you needed an infusion for COVID that you had to go out of the county, we didn't have it here. Uh, and then being diagnosed with an anxiety disorder went from 19.5% to 28.6% during that time. So a, a big impact there, not just to people perceiving that, that anxiety and mental health Decline during the pandemic, the people who actually said, Yes, I had a diagnosis that I didn't have before. Uh, things that went up are uh, improved. The people who were uninsured dropped to 5% from almost 8%. And people who were eating better, eating fruits once a day or vegetables once a day, uh, increased. And also participating in physical activity went from 76% uh, to 84.5%. Uh, so again, that I think it was reflecting of that, you know, people just getting out, buying up all the bikes, going to the parks. Yeah. Yeah, can I just ask a couple questions? Mm -hmm. What was the uh, methodology for acquiring the data? 
the the main data was coming from that survey that was sent out to random households um and then they, they looked at that random based on you know what percent of the population lives in this this zip code uh what percent of the population is in each of these um, age ranges so you didn't have you know 80 percent of the people being 60 and above they they went through and, and filtered it out that way and the questionnaire uh, was basically the center for disease controls behavioral risk factor surveillance survey so it's the same one that the state does it a statewide sampling every year uh, but a much smaller numbers within our county they might have 30 people and say oh that's Fairfield county's numbers where we did 700 uh, and CDC uses those so that we were able to compare our rates to the state rates to, to the national rates. And then in terms of response, was it uh, was there anonymity associated with response or did the respond was the respondent a known quantity? The people that filled it out uh, did not have to give us their name or didn't, didn't even have a place to give us their name. Uh, so we would know their zip code. And then we would have demographic things like their age, sex, income, uh, education, uh, but nothing that would be personally identifiable. The reason I was curious about that really comes down to the last line on your slide there, the acknowledgement that there's been some marijuana use. And I, I just, that actually seems like a low number to me. And I wondered if perhaps there was some non-responsiveness there or some inaccurate response there yes yeah, it's, it's always a uh, possibility you know when you're talking about illicit but of course in this case if it's medical marijuana it's not illegal anymore so um <coughs> but yeah that 11 and a half percent of the people who have been used marijuana within the last month um so these are all going to adults 18 and over <coughs> generally they have to have an address that, you know, that they're getting the mail at. Um, so I think it's a good apples to apples and that it's the same question that we asked three years ago and, the, and those people said 4.3% and now it's up to over 11%. So it's increased quite a bit. It may be that that 11% is underreported, but at least it does show that it's gone about a lot. Relative, relative constant, I understand what you're saying. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Commissioner Fitz. So it sounds like, um, you did a great job of you know spreading the questionnaire out to all the different demographics and geographics and, and all that i'm wondering um who responded right was it uh, skewed in any way on on the people who chose to respond to you or was it all all across the board it was kind of all across the board and like i said the the group that was doing the analysis for the survey made sure that what our census data said was was how our survey laid out. So it wasn't, you know, a lot of women or a lot of men that matched that. It looked at where people lived, uh, looked at their age groups, you know, even looking at the income levels that fell within those general. In the responses, not just in the questions. In the, in the responses. So as you got them back in, if we knew that, hey, we're not getting anybody that's in the 20 to 29 group filling this out, then they would send out more surveys. Gotcha. Uh, in fact, we did send out a lot more surveys than normal helped us get to that much higher response number thank you please continue thank you Joe. okay um yeah the, the um another interesting thing about the marijuana use being at 11 and a half percent is that that's basically the same as the tobacco use was uh which is a big decline in tobacco use um so that's great to see but there's also been that rise uh in marijuana use and uh, i think we didn't do youth survey in this one, but the, the surveys I have seen for, uh, for youth that's kind of reflected the same. It's our you know, smoking cigarettes, but they're using uh, marijuana. Uh, things that improved prescription uh, drug abuse for painkillers has uh, dropped, which is probably due to the state making it harder to get prescription drugs. Uh, knowing someone who uses meth or uses heroin, those numbers dropped. Um, so, you know, some good and bad and a lot of things that kind of stay the same. So the key findings coming out of it um, related to healthcare access. Uh, most of the people in the community do have health insurance of some kind. 4% of children and 7% of adults um, 
that are under age 65 still don't have health insurance. And about half, half of the residents re reported that they had to travel outside of the county for some uh, health care. Uh, which we think about, you know, Pickerington in that area, that's not surprising. Um, but even for a lot of the residents countywide, it, it was still fairly high. Uh, majority of the residents visited a doctor or, you know, or a dentist. Um, economic stability, 8% of children are living under the poverty level. 10% uh, of, of our residents spend at least half of their income on housing. So you know, affordable housing is something we talk about a lot. Uh, and obviously, the more of, of your funding that you have to give to that, leaves you less money for everything else. Um, they also wanted more, you know, need, needed education, uh, needed access to mental health issues and uh, substance abuse treatment. Uh, Education-wise, our high school graduation rate is better than the, the CDC's Healthy People 2030 graduation uh, rate target. So we're good to hear. What is it, the graduation rate? Uh, it was in, in the high 90s, I believe. Thank you. 93% was the answer. Uh, for neighborhood and environment, people um, were worried about burglary, burglary or theft uh, affecting them and their family. Uh, most common concerns with their homes were insects and mold. Uh, in the community, we did a, we also did a survey of community leaders. Like most of the uh, the uh, agencies that provide health services were surveyed. Local officials were surveyed. Uh, in that group, they were highlighting uh, difficulties regarding transportation and affordable housing. So uh, transportation, why do you think that's not a health issue? It certainly is what we call a, a social determinant of health. So just like income, you know, if you don't have reliable education and you can't make it to a job, that's going to have impacts on your health. If you can't get to health care appointments, can't get to your WIC appointment, things like that. Uh, it has to have a uh, broad impact on health. <clears throat> so our next steps are completing our community health improvement plan. <laughs> and we've got that nearing uh, completion. So that's looking at all that data that we collected and then saying, okay, what are we gonna do over the next three years to change that? So we had teams that got together and looked at all those issues and, and have identified some priorities. And then the health department will then create our own strategic plan and say, okay, well, what's the health department going to do over the next three years specifically? Uh, the community one is more broad, uh, including all the you know, health care system and mental health. <laughs> so the priorities came out. Obviously, a lot of it was substance abuse treatment and prevention and mental health care. Those two were, were big issues identified. Uh, access to transportation uh, came up as a, a big issue, and also community outreach and education uh, related to things like chronic disease prevention, you know, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, uh, and healthcare access. Uh, just getting that information out there, what resources are in the community, what things can you know, because a lot of times even the people who are are involved in the health systems don't know what everybody else is doing. And it's unreasonable for us to think that then the public knows that if, if we're, you know, if that's our job, we don't even know it. Um, and when we really look at, you know, what are, what are people dying from? It's still the same, you know, it's cancer and heart disease are the top two. Um, and then obviously during COVID that jumped up, you know, overdose deaths, suicides, things like that all, all kind of uh, come up as, as issues, but by far the leading causes are still cancer and heart disease, and that's related to smoking and tobacco use, or smoking, uh, physical activity, nutrition, all those kinds of things. Our the full printed out assessment you can get from our website. Uh, and also we have an online assessment that we update every year. Uh, so it has statistics for all, all kinds of things related to health causes of, of uh, death, illnesses, all those kinds of rates and you can go and get that on our website as well. That's it. Any more questions? No, I don't have any questions other than the ones I've already asked. And I, I, I was a real nice uh, presentation. I appreciate it, Joe. Uh, Commissioner Levesey, questions, comments, or concerns? No, I don't. I've, uh, over the years, I've seen several of these. Oh, well presented. 
Thank you. So I actually um, worked on reading that whole 4,000 page report. Um, there's a lot of good information in there. Uh, you mentioned the community health improvement plan. What's the timeline you think to, to get that thing put together? I think we're on nearly the final draft. So our, our goal was to get it done by the you know, first part of February and have that completed and send it back out to that whole group and get feedback and hopefully that'll be done here in the next month or so. Thank you, Jeff. Nice job. Yeah, thank you. At this time, the commission sets aside an opportunity for the voters and taxpayers to address the commission. If you would like to do so, please uh, come to the podium there and begin by stating your name and residential address. We do have a three minute rule today, and we appreciate your compliance on that issue. My name is Ray Steeman. 2444 West Point Road, Lancaster. Uh, first, I believe at this time we need to go to prayer. Lord, we come before you this day and we thank you for the air we breathe and the ability to see and talk to well, this day and enjoy the presence with us. And we thank you for each one here this morning. And we pray for your guidance through this day in all our decisions and actions. And may we listen to your directions. Thank you. Amen. One of the things that uh, I was reading yesterday, a comment, some of our devotions, physical bodies cannot occupy the same space at the same time. That's pretty obvious. And uh, we can't be with our physical bodies in two different areas, two places. Because God had, is a spirit and all powerful, and He does not need us for each and everything, but He created you and me to fellowship with Him in a one to one basis or as a group in worship. Too often we pray to the Lord, say, Help me. Do this or that. When we should be praying for you to direct us, Lord, and we need to remember if you need extra help, what's the best source to go to? The body, the man, the God that we enjoy talking with. He created it all, no. And that's who we should be directing our questions to. With that thought in mind, a lot of conservatives that I've talked to, uh, almost 95% of them, are very disappointed at the Republican House. And when they put a Democrat voted for a Democrat, and they're not going to let you know about it throughout the years. And I'm sorry to say, this is not what the conservatives expected from our Republican people we put in power. Good morning. Well, <clears throat> COVID is still making the headlines. COVID shots are toxic depopulation weapon being uh, calibrated for mass uh, ca calling. And the former Pfizer VP, uh, he stated that these are toxic 
premeditated kill weapons for mass depopulation. And I think that I've been kind of stressing this for over a year now. Um, new report reveals that Moderna neglected to share damning data about its new booster with federal vaccine advisors. And also, according to CNN, the report published Wednesday, the infection rate <laughs> that was conveniently withheld from both U.S. Food and Drug Administration and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention vaccine advisors last summer. Next, the FDA vaccine advisors were disappointed and angry that early data about the COVID booster shot wasn't presented for review last year. The updated booster might not be any more effective at preventing COVID-19 infections than the original shot. Next, the uh, EPIC DOP legislation hopes to end the U.S. funding of the World Health Organization. Congressman Roy released this statement, and he said, the WHO not only regularly promotes abortion and radical gender ideology, but also praised China for their leadership at the beginning of COVID-19 and has done nothing to hold the CCP accountable for the spread of COVID. Next, the thread. Why are so many professional athletes, public figures collapsing on live television? And a lot of those are because of the hearts, the hearts. And you spoke, Joe, about this. Now I have to, uh, we both had a question. This just keeps going on and on and coming out. So what is our county health doing about stopping this? Next, Dr. Lena Wynn, Wynn slammed after admitting that there's been overcounting of the COVID deaths. Yeah, that was very political. The CNN medical analyst and Washington Post columnist, Dr. Lena Wynn, admitted in a column Friday that the medical community is overcoming the amount of COVID deaths and hospitalizations. Now look who leads the world in children changing their sex. This is the next headline. I thought this was horrible. We are dealing with what may be the biggest medical and ethical standard of modern times. The United States is the most permissive country in the world in allowing children to pursue extreme transgender transitions such as puberty blockers and surgeries removing young women's healthy breasts. And new report by the group came out, do not harm. And this is their revealing. I thank you. And is there anyone else who would like to address the commission? My name is Alan Turbel. I uh, reside at 4495 Canal Road, Northeast Pleasantville, Ohio, Walnut Township. My family is interested in seeing the proposed utility size solar sort of project take place in Walnut Township. My wife and I have entered into a lease on our farm on February 8th, 2019, after much research. I sent a letter to each of you on December 17th. Of 22 requesting your support and laying out the reasons for entering into a lease along with responses to many of the objections you do no, no doubt receive. I appreciate the fact that you no doubt are seriously evaluating Eastern Cottontail Solar Project being planned by GNEX and EDF. To aid you in your evaluation of this project, I would like to leave with you several documents, including number one, Ohio's Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard, which requires 8.5% of electricity sold by Ohio electric distribution utilities or electric service companies must be generated from a renewable energy source by 2026 in Ohio. Number two, the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center dated May 2017. GNEX developed several solar projects, farm projects in North Carolina over the last several years. This study addresses health and safety aspects of solar. Number three, the solar energy development is a presentation by Dale Arnold Director of Energy Development for the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. 
This was presented at the, our fairgrounds in September of 2022 to Farm Bureau members from Fairfield and Pickaway County due to the interest uh, in solar. The paper I'm leaving you does a good job pointing out what's taking place in the energy markets and the closure of many Ohio power plants in the interest in solar technology. Farm Bureau's purpose is to provide and educate their members without taking a position for or against. I do apologize. There are a few pages that uh, didn't turn out as well as I'd like to see them a little bit uh, fuzzy. Number four is an article on the supply shortages and the potential impact. I present these documents to you and thank you for your consideration and request your support. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who would like to address the commission at this time? We thank you all for coming. <coughs> Amy, I'll leave. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, I just want to follow up with an update from last week. Uh, the Wilson Road resolution is in for board's consideration. On that resolution, it's a request for the board to execute the maintenance group for the city of Lancaster and to put through the group of parcels we discussed last week. Um, it's you, Commissioner Davis, as the signatory on both the agreement and the proclaimed deeds. Wonderful. That's it. All right. Thank you, Amy. Um, Annie Cordell. All right, ARCFC, the numbers from last week are unchanged from the 30.6. We have 19.6 being appropriated, 10.3 extended, and 4.9 encumbered or completed. Uh, Dan Neely has an update for us on the new phone system or the Unified Telecommunications Project. Unified Communications. Um, <laughs> uh, so at this point, we've got uh, firm cutover dates for telephone numbers uh, to be in the new system. Uh, for two smaller departments, they will be our first to go. Uh, one is EMA, thank you for us volunteering, uh, as well as veterans. Um, and that is set for the 1st of February, so they will be our first to cut over. Uh, we continue the build out uh, and testing with our project management team from ATC, who is the organization selected in the RFP process. Uh, there is a call center component to this, uh, which is like more sophisticated routing of calls uh, and reporting that is sort of a side um, to this uh, being worked on with primarily the JFS uh, folks. They have uh, those sort of needs, uh, but our intent to complete the project by the end of the first quarter this year uh, is on track. Can I ask a question on the data that you the word data might have been in your description there. I'm just curious. When the system is fully operational, let's say, the unified communication system, um, would, would you or someone at your direction then have access to, to data that would say, for example, EMA received 99 external calls this week. Yes. Do we have that data now? Uh, no. But we will. Yes. That was one of the components of the RFP. And then the other question I had is in terms of the cutover, as you've called it, the current service to the next service at, let's say, EMA. Mm -hmm. Is there a duration of time that you anticipate monitoring the experience before you would move to the wider cutover? Uh, good question. I would say that you know, from the project management standpoint, they don't, you know, the testing is being done before that cutover occurs. So um, the ability, since it's a completely separate system, and that newer system allows us to have active numbers in place, uh, permits us the ability to test it fully prior to that cover. So the intent is that we know what we are getting prior to saying, let's go. 
So, you know, I, I would see the project, you know, kind of snowballing as soon as we got the first couple uh, across. And we do have a number of other departments that are saying, hey, we're ready, we want to go. And they've been in the midst of, you know, talking through and testing uh, theirs as well. Thank you, Dan. I apologize for not recalling. Have you concluded your remarks when I interrupted you? Yes. Questions from commissioners? Um, please continue. All right, next topic, solar array project at one stop. So John, uh, our EMA and facilities director, does have a little bit of an update for us and maybe some pictures. Yeah, I, uh, I now I didn't put a lot of uh, design work in there, so I apologize for that. And I don't know what that ringing is. No, don't hear a thing. <laughs> um, uh, so just a schedule moving forward. Uh, we are in process with the new uh, connection to the what we call the guard shack, and that allows us to release the right of way. Um, that was completed, and we'll have a couple pictures there. Um, what's the next step is um, this week, South Central Power will come out, review that connection with Claypool Electric, uh, prove that it is uh, proper and, and ready to go, and then we can request, which we've already done, the right of way. Um, Release. So once we have South Central Power's approval of that right of way release, then we can proceed with construction. The, the initial response I got uh, was that it could take a few days to a few weeks, which I impressed that that would be a few days would be the ideal uh, on, on requesting that release or having South Central approve that release for right away. And then um, the construction timeline is it have factors in about two weeks and then uh, for that right away release, and then we would have a completion date March one. So that that completion date slides based on how long it takes for the right away to get released. Um, site prep and construction, it, they call wrapping and stacking would happen very quickly uh, and would go up pretty quickly. That's really good. The next one. So um, that panel you see in your left is what essentially would be deleted, and, and you can kind of see the flags as that right away that costs us an issue. Next one. This is the new connection, nice and uh, directional board back under the building to power the guard shack. And then this is just the general view of where the, the, the facility will be. So in this green space, uh, you would see that um, solar field. Seeing it would be something as we expect that there will be some screening requirements from the city of Lancaster. So seeing it from the street may be um, a combination of trees or fence or something we're, we're still working through what the screening requirements the city will have us do and one last thing uh, that's just kind of what you will see so two highlights um, because of this change we're actually able to increase the size of it so so more productivity um, so that's a benefit and then um, so what you see in that pink area would be the the panels and then the purple would be a fence um, and then uh, also in our latest construction meeting, we had another bit of good news. If you want to go to the last slide, there's a lot of verbiage and it looked like it got cut off a little bit at the top. I don't, I think it's because of the screen share. But basically in the Infrastructure uh, Reduction Act, it allows local governments to, to receive a, a payment of 15% of any projects that were installed. So we actually hope to see, and we're trying to work through all the, the mechanisms uh, some some money back on this project for installing that solar field based on the infrastructure. So real early on, haven't got all the details worked out, but we we do anticipate that we're eligible uh, in that direct payment. Or there's another option of uh, sequestration and bonds. So I do not know much about that. I'm going to have to learn a lot about what that means. John, I know I've asked this question before. I for some reason I can't can't get, keep the number in my head. How many buildings does the county have? Buildings is a tougher one. It's it's almost 40, but campus we consider campuses is, is 29. Okay. And once this pilot project with the the net metered grid tied solar project, uh, this the one building, this one pilot will will have that, that solar rig. The other 29 or 40 buildings, they'll, they'll all still be powered by fossil fuels, right? Yeah. 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 So something to cheer about, right? 
one out of yes, I, I, I yeah. I have a quick question, if I might. Um, probably almost as innocuous. Um, the guard shack, right? Every we just you just told us we're going to work on powering the guard shack, or we have done that. Yeah. I've probably driven by that guard shack several hundred times. <laughs> Never met the guard. I'm just wondering why we worry about having power in the guard shack. Tony's got a little more. It, it has to do with water. So it is actually the water meters in there. So you have the light heat for the building and then the Lancaster. That facility is on, it's our water system um, because some of the regulations that cast iron pipes, um, what the city requires. So they put a master meter there and then put um, plastic pipe in the facility as opposed to cast iron. So it's a water meter shack. Okay. But if we need a guard there, we have a shack. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Thank you. I mean, as long as we're not paying a guard. I'm fine. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, Business Advisory Council, our local one, receives a two star designation. It's being recognized this year with that designation and recognizes the commitment to embed elements of the three quality practices. Uh, the Fairfield County Education Service Center is the entity receiving the award. However, our Economic and Workforce Development Director, Rick Zabrak, is the chair of the Business Advisory Council, and Fairfield County's career readiness and pre-apprenticeship programs were integral, integral components to this recognition. Right? Yeah, that's, um, we basically got it. I mean, it's, it's our career readiness program is, is really what got this designation. Uh, Commissioner Pick was at a EAC meeting about three years ago or so. Um, and saw what condition it was in at that time, and it's come a long way in the last uh, last couple of years to get this designation. So uh, proud of that, and uh, you know, we got more plans this next couple of years. So uh, okay. three uh, councils uh, receive like the, the funding and other things. If they like get the top award, that'll be us. Uh, and maybe next year. Okay. What's the top stars? How do we start? Four. Four. Oh. We're working our way there. Yeah. All right, uh, governor's budget request for workforce center funding. Uh, Rick, myself, Commissioner Levesey, and Ohio University Lancaster Dean Tudor met with Representative Kevin Miller and Director Matt Dam Schroeder of ODJFS regarding the governor's budget request last week. Um, both were very receptive to the information that we shared, asked really great questions. Uh, this is in response to the governor um, post visit or during his visit. Um, compelling us to make sure that we were requesting something within his budget. And uh, the total ask is approximately right now around 4.2 million, uh, tidying that up today, tomorrow, and then formally submitting that to everyone to make sure they have our updated request. This is a change. Uh, after meeting with Representative LeRae uh, prior to the holidays, he suggested that we expand that request uh, to meet all of the needs that we would have. And this is uh, getting closer to that. Anything else? Well, I appreciate uh, the time last week and meeting with, with folks. They were both, uh, this was Representative Miller's second visit, and he uh, was here about a year ago, I believe, and uh, came through. and He's just like, wow, look at all this new stuff. Like, it's you know, our goal, I always say, is to have something new for people to see every time they step foot in there. And uh, he was definitely impressed. And it's been about an hour and a half of this time, I think, with us, and I was very on board with our mission. Very excited. Commissioner Fix, anything else to add? Yeah, so I, you know, it was a very good meeting. We, we did it via Zoom with uh, Director Dan Schroeder. And I think he was very impressed by what we were doing, uh, as well as the fact that we were contributing, the amount of money we were contributing, he said, at, in, in and of, of itself, she really helped to get this approved. So um, I've Appreciate Commissioner Levesey jumping in last minute. I was unable to join. Um, this is part of a whole series of meetings that we're having uh, with our uh, elected officials up and down the chain. Uh, I know we've got uh, Congressman Balderson coming in soon. Um, we're we're engaging the people that we need to engage to get this money rolling in. So I'm, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic, and I appreciate the work that Ani and Rick and Commissioner Levesey are doing to make that happen. All right. 
All right, moving on to highlights of resolutions. Review packet contains a list of administrative approvals, and there are 40 resolutions for the voting meeting today. A couple resolutions of note, as Amy mentioned, there is a resolution to approve the maintenance agreement with the City of Lancaster uh, for its maintenance of Wilson Road, as well as conveyance of those two remnant parcels. We also have a resolution to appropriate from unappropriated uh, for TB clinic services. This is a requirement from the Ohio Revised Code that the, the general fund uh, uh, provide uh, TB treatment services to anyone um, that is indigent and unable to take care of that themselves. Joe, you want to add anything to that at all? No, I think the, the one TB case we had, uh, we were able to track down his residency and in, in it's across the Lincoln County, so. <laughs> oh, so this the one that we talked about is not yeah. Um, ultimately, that area it's like Reynoldsburg, so it's Franklin County, Fairfield County, Franklin County. So sometimes and we argue over whose whose house it is, it switches around between health departments. So I think we're all gonna be okay. Okay, so Send we will be prepared for the up. future, or you could not vote on it. <laughs> I don't know. It's not a big deal. I'm not troubled by putting some money there. If we don't spend it, we don't spend it. All right, very well. Thanks for that update, Joe. Uh, we also have um, the increased allocation for the Fairfield Area Humane Society, as we talked about last week, uh, for your consideration. And Jeremiah has a couple resolutions on um, that I'll point out um, the annual county highway system mileage certification. So approving all of the mileage of the county roads there, and also a resolution to allow weight reductions on county and township roads for 23. Um, we also have a resolution on for a memo expense, memo receipt, for birth certificates paid to the health department from JFS. So working out an internal way to be able to be paying for those. Um, thanks to Josh and Corey and the rest of the team for, for ironing that out. I think also individuals in the auditor's office were very helpful there. We also have a resolution to approve the purchase of 12 vehicles for the sheriff's department. And then lastly, two resolutions authorizing the approval of mortgages on program year 21 uh, CHIP uh, program of rehab constructions. Bart, any budget review? Uh, no, we're in the process of changing over the reports from 22 to 23. We should have that done pretty soon. All so right. That right now. Okay, thank you. Recognition. County Auditor Dr. Brown thanked the facilities team, in particular Tammy, Heather, and Mike for their great work in painting offices on the second floor of the historic courthouse. She's also appreciative of how the facilities team has worked to locate the auditor's office financial systems employees in one area. The move allowed for cross-training and the ability to work across unit lines. Um, I had this shout out before, but I think it, it's worthwhile to mention again because of all the positive feedback we do receive about this person, Jenny Sturgeon at the Workforce Center. So a number of people come into contact with her, but overwhelmingly positive feedback I get about her and her ability to meet any need uh, folks have there. So very fortunate to have her um, there as the um, first line of service at the Workforce Center. All right, Rochelle, calendar review and invitations received, please. Today, the commissioners have the following meetings. Uh, commissioners Fix and Levesey have the Investment Advisory Committee meeting at 1030, and Commissioner Davis, the Lancaster Fairfield Public Transit meeting also at 1030. The Land Bank meeting is at 11 o'clock with all three commissioners, and then each commissioner has the Planning Next meeting at 12, 1, and 2. Family, Adult, and Children First Council, um, meet at the Fairfield County Job and Family Services building on January 19th at 8.30. The workforce meeting with Representative Balderson is on January 19th at 10 o'clock at the Fairfield County Workforce Center. Beyond the checklist of adverse childhood experiences is a Zoom program on January 23rd at 8.45 a.m. Meals on Wheels annual meeting and volunteer recognition event is January 26th at 3.15 the Meals on Wheels Senior Services Center. And then the Polar Plunge on January 29th, beginning at one o'clock. My understanding is people can arrive at 11. That is the Buckeye Lake Winery in just a, Thornville. Just a note on that too. I understand the weather forecast is improving. It's supposed to be a uh, low of 18 that day. I think a high of 30 is what uh, I'm hearing. Uh, so uh, it's, it's getting better. 
No ice. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we'll see. I don't know. I'll, I'll be there for moral support. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that. Please continue. For correspondence, we have from um, the uh, Lancaster Eagle Gazette, written by Jeff Barron. County commissioners look to transportation, housing, and more for 2023. That was published on January 12th this year. In 2022, CCAO annual report, the letter from a county resident regarding proposed solar farms, a Fairfield County Municipal Court Criminal Traffic Division fee report for 2022, a press release from Fairfield County Park Dis District dated January 6th, Hague Foundation makes possible property acquisition. From the Fairfield County Prosecutor's Office on January 9th, the Law Enforcement Trust Fund report, a news release from Lancaster Fairfield County Chamber of Commerce on January 13th, Lancaster Fairfield County Chamber of Commerce launching national civics. An op-ed from the Office of the County Auditor dated January 13th to Fairfield County Schools officials regarding changes to help improve efficiency with schools in Fairfield County. A memo from Dr. Carrie Brown, County Auditor on January 13th, subject software as a service, dashboard, continuing education, employee development, Outreach to schools, training for Licking County, and thanks to the facilities team. A thank you note also from the Fairfield County Auditor for the collaborative planning for 2023. And a flyer from Fairfield County 211 regarding resources during cold temperatures. A flyer regarding drop off locations and item needs to assist individuals in our community. And from the Office of the County Auditor, the current agricultural use valuation renewal application. That is it. Thank you, Rochelle. Just one I'll point out there is um, uh, we did receive a request for um, collecting donations for the homeless. And so within um, the offices here in the historic courthouse, we are doing a collection. Um, and Lori Hawk is uh, kindly gathering all of those. But hats, gloves, scarves, hygiene items, first aid kits, uh, hand and feet warmers, flashlights, backpacks. Uh, and also some protein and meal bars. So if anyone would like to contribute to that, we have a, a collection point here as well. Jail population last week was 235 with 25 of those being contracted placements and the sheriff reports today, it is 248 with 20 of those being contracted placements. That's all I have, Commissioner. Thank you. Any report business? Uh, anything, Commissioner Levis? Commissioner Tate. Uh, so last week we uh, participated in the transportation improvement district meeting that uh, Jeremiah leads and continue to be impressed by the uh, work that that group is doing and how it's grown right we, uh, we probably had 25 people sitting in that room it used to be five so um, really pleased with the progress we're making there a lot of big projects in the works and I appreciate Jeremiah's work there um, last week we kind of reconvened a good portion of the group that participated in the housing summit last summer um, and kind of checked in to see the progress that we're making. And uh, I'm pleased to report that um, we are making pretty significant progress on a lot of fronts um, and expect that this summer we should have a number of the projects that kind of need to um, come to fruition to move things forward. Uh, by the time we get to this summer, this, this project should be done. Um, we'll be able to reconvene the townships, the villages and all the interested parties um, to uh, then you know talk about the next steps now that we've got all these tools in place now it's time to move forward so um i feel pretty good about the progress we're making there um continue to participate in the, the one ohio um board um one ohio foundation the opiate settlement um making better progress there than we had in the recent past still a ways to go but we expect that this summer uh, and into the fall, we'll be starting to uh, send out money to the regions. Um, and finally, uh, participate in the Regional Planning Commission Executive Committee meeting with uh, James uh, last week. And um, we're in the final days of James's time with us here. Um, but we've got a, a short term plan in place and a, a longer term plan in place. I appreciate our HR department's uh, willingness and ability to, to help find the long range long-term um, answer to the question is who's going to try to fill James' shoes. So um, we're making progress there as well. That's all I have, sir. No business for me. Any new business, Mr. Hudson? I don't. Mr. Uh, thank you. So under new business, I just want to mention a scheduling note and I guess policy issue, but um, the 1030 meeting that 
that I and I are having with Chasmine Carter. Um, I, I don't know the the duration on that, but I anticipate that it'll lead into uh, land bank. So I don't I don't expect to be able to make that the eleven o'clock land bank. I'm not going to cut that meeting off to to go be in land bank. Uh, I, I get there as soon as I can if that's the way it works out, but. The other thing to mention, I just want to mention too, is uh, on the, the subject matter of the meeting with Chaslin is a review of the RLS proposal and the timeline associated with getting data back on the status of public transportation and the mechanics. A potential transfer of that department uh, from the city of Lancaster to the county. That's what's in the RLS proposal because that's what I asked for. And just wanted to give my colleagues an opportunity to question or comment on those issues prior to that 10 30 meeting. As far as, you know, I think it's pretty interesting when uh, Joe uh, talked about. Uh, Community health assessment, and much of that component had to do with transportation. So, I don't want to be affected workforce, but it's affecting a lot of areas. So, I think this is a very good work you're doing. So, I'm appreciative of your continuing efforts on the transportation front. Um, just so we're all clear, going through the process that you're going through today, we're not committing to anything yet, right? No, what I would envision, I mean, one of the subjects that we want to discuss with Chatham, the director of Lancaster, is the timeline associated with continuing the potential grant process for the study versus the timeline for us taking action in and of ourselves. Okay. We we'll kind of compare those timelines. And in control of, of that review environment. Um, depending on the result of those conversations, discussions, um, one potential outgrowth would be a resolution uh, to enter into the agreement with RLS. Um, that can't be done in that private meeting with one commissioner and won't be. RLS isn't in this meeting. Um, I'm not sure yet if legals had a chance to conduct their review of the proposal, but that obviously needs to occur. Uh, and then even in the environment where let's say we decide to proceed on our own. We have the resolution. We enter into the agreement with RLS. That's still not any commitment on behalf of the commission to effectuate change in public transportation or to negotiate the transfer of that department from one entity to another. So I'm just laying out multiple staging areas along the way uh, for you know any one or all of the commissioners to you know influence the direction and result of this process uh, I, I probably come at it with a bias which sure uh, i'll disclose which is if we, the commissioners, mention a concern about an area of service in our community, the end result of that discussion should be improvement. Otherwise, it's just discussion, and, and, and I don't favor that. Nor do I, and as I mentioned, I appreciate your continuing efforts on that topic. Thank you. Anything else under new business? Dr. Brown? I just wanted to report that the software as a service has concluded in terms of its conversion. And we are now in maintenance mode of that and have seen a number of different efficiencies from that conversion. 
and also thinking about the civic education and outreach, the schools have been very receptive and positive for the number of changes relating to the Budget Commission, as well as the um, presentations that we're conducting to be helpful to schools and those who may have interest in careers in local government, perhaps in mapping. And we talk a lot about planning and uh, the team actually wanted to say thank you for the planning that occurs at all levels. And to give you an example of how that gratefulness is operationalized on Friday, um, the developer had desired to transfer property prior to closing. And there were a number of things wrong with the plan in order to make that happen. And there was a great deal of cooperation between the engineer and the auditor's office to make those corrections and put things in place so that they could still meet their closing. It would have been um, perfectly acceptable to hand it back and say, you need to make these corrections and bring it back to us. Um, but making several phone calls and being able, and some people were even on vacation, were able to help with that. So as you think about things that are pro-development, that is one example um, that comes to mind in terms of how that planning is operationalized. I also just want to point out that we are creating a new dashboard. The dashboard will be similar to our year in review document. So if you have particular data sets or elements that you want to see on a dashboard, just let me know because we're in the planning process for that. And then we are beginning our training with Licking County, so the transition for Licking County to serve as the fiscal officer for the MCJDC. And that training revol revolves around accounts payable, pay, um, payroll, as well as financial reporting. And we're available all year to them to help that process. There must have been a cybersecurity um, test or perhaps a true phishing um, over the weekend. I know that several people have received um, phishing emails and I hope they're hitting the phishing button, but we're thinking that maybe 30 or 40 people received some over the weekend. Thank you. Is there any other issue or item that anybody would like to bring to the attention of the commission at this time? Hearing none, we'll move on to our voting pattern. Please rise if you're able to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Rochelle, do we have any announcements? There are no new announcements. So moved. Second. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Minutes passed 3 0. From the commissioners, we have resolution 2023 1.17.A. A resolution to approve maintenance agreement with the City of Lancaster for its maintenance of Wilson Road and conveyance of two remnant parcels. Parcel numbers 01401125201520 and 05313440030 to the city of Lancaster. And the commissioners will move items A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. So go. I will say, Commissioner, I did um, correspond with Stephanie Hall, and she's aware this resolution is on here today. And she's supportive of it, of it obviously, as well. <laughs> I, I agree, Commissioner Davis. I think uh, they may have the impression that everybody's in the loop on this and aware. So it's striking me a lot. I apologize for that. Probably could have had. 
No, I'm sorry. We're giving them land, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do anything else. Yes. <laughs> They're not here to accept the gift. Sure. Can we give them more? <laughs> yeah, right. We should give them all the rights. Yeah, right. All the rights. I want to do more. Yeah. Well, frankly, it's a it's a piece of Wilson Road that's you know contiguous contiguous to Fair Avenue there in Lancaster. Um, Lancaster is uh, in the process of, of annexing out in that area for future development, and it only makes sense for them to have the road. Uh, the parcels in question are parcels that are part of the right of way from the 33 bypass, so they're not a useful piece. Um, it just makes sense for Lancaster to be in control of that. So. I'm having a I, they, uh, some years ago, and I'm, I'm not recalling what year it would have been, but I and I think others too became curious as to how many properties does the county even own? And, and I recall when we were looking at that question, it was a much more complicated answer than what we had expected, in part because at one time, all the properties were or not all, but many of the properties were titled in some way that made finding them more difficult. Some would be called the Fairfield County Board of Commissioners, some would be called Fairfield County, and I think there were some other names that were being used, and I think some effort was made to clean that up and, and, and have them be searchable in, in that way. But many, many, many of the properties were rented properties. And you know, one of the things that, that we talked about this in a few years ago was, you know, is there a plan, is there a purpose, is there a need for these remnant properties? Could anything else be done with them, or shall we just know them forever? Um, and, and I think this fits yes. uh, with that discussion had several years ago, which is if a productive, useful purpose can be made of remnant properties, then we should be in favor of that. And, and I mean, that's an awful long speech. Um, I believe that Lisa McKenzie could probably answer your question for you. She's got that little Cheshire grin going on back there. I, I actually do have that answer. All right. 182 previous to this transaction. And that work was done a couple of years ago, but so it may be plus or minus a couple. All right. Thank you. Nothing for further. Further discussion. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Levis? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motions passed 3 0. From the Fairfield County Auditor, Resolution 2023 1.17.I, a resolution authorizing a memo, ex, a memo expense memo receipt for the general fund 2% administration fee for managing the county self insurance program, fund number 5376 to general 1001. So moved. Second. This is just traditional process in order to have that fee move to the general fund. Um, it's under the auditor because the auditors prepared the resolution. The general fund revenue um, is a fungible source. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motion passes 3 0 from Fairfield County Board of Developmental Disabilities, Resolution 2023 1.17.j. .dot .dot a resolution to approve a reimbursement for share of cost for F Ethernet services paid to AT&T as a memo expenditure for fund number 2060. So moved. Second. Discussion? Please go roll. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. From the Fairfield County Board of Elections, resolution 2023-1.17.K. A resolution to appropriate from unappropriated in a major expenditure object category for fund number 2861, Cyber Board of Elections. So moved. Second. Discussion? Please call the roll. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. From the Fairfield County Clerk of Courts Legal Division, Resolution 2023 1.17.L, a resolution granting Brandon C. Meyer, Clerk of Courts and staff permission to attend travel. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. 
Motion passes 3 0. From Fairfield County Court of Common Pleas, Resolution 2023 1.17.m, a resolution to appropriate from unappropriated in a major expenditure object category, Fairfield County Common Pleas, TCAP Grant 2852. So moved. Second. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. From the Fairfield County Engineer, Resolution 2023 1.17.n, a resolution to approve the annual county highway system mileage certification for 2022. In the Fairfield County Engineer, I move items N, O, P, Q, and R. Second. I was curious the, the number of the, the 361 is that reasonably constant? I think uh, when I started it, it was right at 363. Little things make changes sometimes. Uh, for instance, the bridge we replaced down here on Hornsville, we uh, took out some of that curve. So that shortened that up here. I mean, we're talking decimal points, but that's all that was. Mm -hmm. So, uh, resolution R of weight reduction is this a later than normal? No, this is about when we typically put those on. It's uh, and this is the time of year it's meant for when we start getting close to February, we can have those extreme freeze and falls. Um, that's what we try to protect them from. Thank you. Further discussion? Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motions passed 3 0. From Fairfield County Job and Family Services, Resolution 2023 1.17.S, a resolution to approve a memo expense memo receipt for the cost of birth certificates paid to Fairfield County Health Departments as a memo expenditure for fund number 2072 Public Children's Services. The Fairfield County Job and Family Services, let me write S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. And AA. Second. Second. Don't you want to add anything? Um, just to piggyback off what you said earlier in regards to the um, resolution regarding uh, between DFS and uh, Health Department, it'll save us about 32 hours a year in terms of processing. So it's a huge time savings and cost efficient. Thank you. Further discussion? Please follow. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motions pass 3 0. From the Fairfield County Juvenile Probate Court, Resolution 2023 1 17.bb, a resolution to amend the certificate conversion of prior year 2021 encumbrance to current year appropriation, reduce current year appropriations, youthful driver safety fund number 2872. The Fairfield County Juvenile Probate Court, I'm inviting to BB and CC. Second. Discussion. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motions passed 3 0. From Fairfield County Sheriff, Resolution 2023 1.17.BD, a resolution to approve the purchase of six vehicles from Chapman Ford following a competitive invitation to bid process. The Fairfield County Sheriff, I'm inviting to DD, EE, and FF. Second. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motions passed 3 0. From Fairfield County Utilities Department, Resolution 2023 1.17.gg, .gg, a resolution to approve a reimbursement for share of costs as a memo expenditure for fund number 5044, 5046, 5842, and 5841. From Fairfield County Utilities, I move items GG, HH, II, JJ, and KK. Second. Let me go. Can I see GG scroll down a little bit or do I do that? All right. Our first two are resolutions for paying the board. The first one's the Maximus, the second one's for Ethernet. The last three are transfers to pay bonds. Thank you. What? The, Brief description that we see on our agenda made GG and HH look good. I just want to make sure and yep. what I was further discussion. Please go. 
Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Resolutions passed 3 0 from Lancaster Fairfield Community Action Agency. Resolution 2023 1.17.LL. A resolution authorizing the approval of the mortgage on a program year 2021 community housing impact and preservation program rehab construction for Richard and Brenda Mason. Near Lancaster Fairfield County Community Action Agency, I move items LL and MM. Second. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motions pass 3 0. Payment of bills. Resolution 2023 1.17.NN. A resolution authorizing the approval of payments of the vouchers without appropriate carryover purchase orders and the cash disbursement for all departments that are approved by the commissioner. So moved. Second. Discussion. Please call the roll. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. The next regular meeting is scheduled for next Tuesday, January 24th at 9 a.m. Just so everybody's on the board of the schedule, um, 10 30, we we'll either have a meeting with students on transitions, also at 10 30, my colleagues have a advisory committee meeting. Uh, then at 11 o'clock, 